Welcome, welcome to the um, CTA Durham Path uh, Lecture Series. Uh, today, we're going to uh, just look at unknowns from the LSU 5. So these were posted on the, the Phillips site, and we only have four unknowns this week. But just to clarify what we're doing, we're going to give lectures from the chapters for a few weeks, usually like the first three weeks of a month. And then the last lecture will be unknowns from those chapters. So the reason we only have uh, four today is because I'm only doing unknowns from one of the chapters, but just trying to get this launched. This is our first time to do this, but we are going to start taping these lectures as you probably have been told, and then you'll be able to watch them on your own time. So we won't do them live anymore at 4 p.m. on Sundays, and then they'll just be made available. So what you wanna do with these uh, unknowns is the, the histories will go out, which I saw the email that they did. Uh, we have four histories and then you should go in and challenge yourself in uh, trying to guess them. And you're welcome to uh, email back uh, your answers, which won't be shared in this lecture, but if you want uh, input or anything on them, happy to uh, do that. So you can do, email those in to whoever is giving you the lecture for the week. So we're putting all of the unknowns into one file to make it easier for you to find in the Phillips. And uh, this is all the, the four LSU uh, cases. So the first one is LSU 5A and the clinical is a 44 year old female with a reticulate brown patch on the left frontal scalp. So you can see here, there's a, a nice punch. Uh, we can line it up and then already you can see at this power that there's an inflammatory cell infiltrate. And so we wanna describe this as uh, superficial and deep and we can see that the epidermis is um, altered. So the way we uh, go at these, uh, uh, Bernard Ackerman's uh, classification started with classifying the infiltrate, whether it was superficial and deep, but we uh, tend to look at the epidermis first and say, is it normal? Is it altered? And if it's altered, in what way is it altered? So you can see that this is clearly not normal and uh, we can go to an interface uh, dermatitis here. So you have a superficial and deep, slightly deep, and you can see these are where hairs are. So this is perifollicular and it's almost getting down into the subcutis. So uh, I want to go right now to this is an old uh, teaching tool that I started using uh, <laughs> 14 years ago. And Phil Lavoie proposed this at one point, and I heard him lecture uh, a year or two ago, and he had made this a little fancier than this. But uh, um, I actually like this uh, system right here. So when we talk about interface dermatitis, so this is a classification of interface dermatitis, and we divide it into four patterns, and, and I'm assigning a disease that it's closest to. So you have erythema multiforme-like, meaning it's acute. So we could also say acute interface, but EM-like. And then you have lupus-like, which is chronic and generally atrophic. Uh, and then you have like in planus like, which is uh, not atrophic and chronic, uh, thicker epidermis. And then mycosis fungoides like, which mycosis fungoides causes epidermal acanthosis in a psoriasiform pattern, like you might see in psoriasis or in a, in a contact uh, dermatitis. So you still see the band like infiltrate, but you see epidermal change. So we're describing the epidermal changes here. So here you'll still have a nice basket weave stratum corneum. Here you'll have this thin, usually thin epidermis. Uh, and here you'll have the thicker epidermis hypergranulosis. And then here you'll have the psoriasiform. And then these are lined up in order of how common, most common to least common. And so erythema multiforme, acute, can be viral. We can have acute drug eruption, acute collagen vascular disease. Uh, one of our most common is our uh, lichen planus like keratosis comes in many flavors and so it can actually be in uh, this pattern and we often uh, back off and just call them benign lichenoid keratoses or lichenoid keratosis when you can't really when it doesn't look like lichen planus. 
So chemotherapy, acute graft versus host, pityriasis like anoides is an interface, erythema dyschromic and perstantia is a really subtle interface. So lupus, we see lupus and all the other collagen vascular diseases. Once again, the lichenoid keratosis, fixed drug, which is chronic, often EOs and newts are the clue. You can have neutrophils in lupus, though sometimes, rarely. Uh, the center of porokeratosis is atrophic in interface, and it's, this is an error to, uh, that can occur. You can sometimes biopsy a porokeratosis lesion. They're annular, and you'll get an answer back of lupus, and you're actually just not seeing the columns. And then like in sclerosis, and I've taken off the et atrophicus here because it's not always uh, atrophic. Remember that this is SUS when you make your um, <coughs> presentations. Then lichen planus, the most common lichen planus pattern is just the lichenoid keratosis, as you know. We get biopsy quite a bit. And then lichen planus and hypertrophic lupus is also in here. So, so when you don't have the atrophic lupus can be hypertrophic. And these can be very difficult to distinguish uh, from each other. Fixed drug eruption, lichenoid drug eruption, lichen nitidus. And then you get down to mycosis fungoides. Once again, the lichenoid keratosis is there. Mycosis fungoides, another drug eruption. So the center of uh, actinic porokeratosis is atrophic and lupus-like, but the center of porokeratosis of mabelli is actually uh, psoriasiform lichenoid. So it can look like uh, mycosis fungoides, lichen striatus, uh, the, uh, some of the PPPDs, uh, PRP, which uh, uh, can be uh, doesn't have the, the best, uh, most specific histologic findings. Uh, uh, parts of ILVIN, uh, syphilis can uh, be in this pattern, and then CD30 uh, positive lymphoproliferative disorder. So I find this very useful. Uh, it's a good way to get your handle around interface. If you just back off to what does it look like, if we can go back to our case here, this is what I would classify as the lupus-like pattern. So what you see is you see a thin epidermis here. We only have a few cell layers. You see the, the basalis doesn't have the nice basaloid cells anymore. And I like the term squamatization of the basalis. Um, and then uh, we don't see any hypergranulosis. And then we see all these melanophages, which is simply a sign of chronicity. And you'll see more in darker uh, skin. Uh, less than others, but it means it didn't just happen. So we wouldn't see these uh, melanophages as much in an acute process unless it's been occurring repeatedly, like in a fixed drug eruption that keeps erupting back. The other things you can see here is you see this basement membrane zone, which looks a little bit glassy here, and that's the smudging of the basement membrane zone. And a PASD can uh, nicely uh, uh, highlight this. And then you see the superficial and deep. And when you get into superficial and deep in a dermatitis, the differential becomes less. And certainly um, we know that uh, lymphoma is in the differential. As much as we like to talk, we like to talk about top heavy and bottom heavy infiltrates, meaning there's more lymphocytes down here, more likely lymphoma. That is in general still true. So this is a top heavy infiltrate. Lymphoma doesn't cause an interface like this as much. And just keep in mind that this isn't the pattern of mycosis fungoides, which is psoriasiform <coughs> and uh, uh, in the epidermal chain. So superficial and deep, chronic interface, melanophages, and then the perifollicular is really good for lupus too. Uh, lupus loves the follicles. You can find plasma cells in this infiltrate. Um, I didn't mark any. Uh, but uh, we look for the little clock face uh, nuclei. Uh, let me see if we can find one to show you since we only have too many cases. More melanophages here uh, than the, uh, there's one right there. So eccentric round nucleus, pink, and you can't quite appreciate the clock face there. There's one, I'm, I'm, but, so these aren't the greatest clock face nuclei that we'd like to see, but the, that's definitely a plasma cell. So plasma cells <coughs> useful in lupus, always, you know, now that we have uh, syphilis having reemerged, you should always be on the lookout uh, for that. This epidermal change isn't the typical um, uh, syphilis, but I recommend doing the 
immunostain or serologies if you don't have the immunostain available, uh, if there's any suspicion at all in your steam plasma cells. So uh, the, when it first reemerged, we would miss cases and um, went back and uh, they had the commonality as they all have plasma cells. So this is very good for lupus. And um, this is the 44 year old female with a brown patch. So the brown patch is from all this post-inflammatory pigmentary alteration. And then just keep in mind when we talk about poikiloderma, we're talking kind of about brown from post-inflammatory, anywhere there's lymphocytes will be red clinically. So you have red and brown, and then you may uh, see white from uh, atrophy. So this was called blashkitis. And so I assume it's a linear lesion on the scalp. And we do have uh, reports of dysphoid lupus occurring in a linear, uh, mimicking the uh, kudasab uh, morphia. So one just uh, uh, big concept to take away is that almost any dermatitis can present in a linear pattern. And I've seen linear like in Pinopilaris uh, on the scalp, uh, which this is not, um, but I've also seen, um, uh, you can see linear like in Planus. So just be kind of in general, leave your mind open for almost any dermatitis occasionally being linear. But so then going back to our case, how does this differ from a tumid lupus or another collagen vascular disease? I recommend not, uh, it's up to the, the clinical evaluation to decide the flavor of collagen vascular disease. And the job from the pathology end is simply to call it a um, collagen vascular disease and be as definitive as you can. One, some of the features, if, if we have dermatomyositis, you get atrophy even beyond what we're seeing here to where it's just like one or two cell layers thick. So that's a feature of um, uh, 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 dermatomyositis, not the mucin, uh, mucinous lesions, but the atrophic lesions. But telling uh, like this discoid lesion from, <coughs> um, from, a, from subacute lupus, we don't spend a lot of a time uh, doing that. The onus is on the uh, clinician to look at the clinical presentation and the serologies and figure out whether it's an isolated lesion or systemic. One thing that has been hugely, hugely helpful uh, to us, though, has been the um, CD123 uh, immunostain, which is the plasma cytoid dendritic cell marker. And uh, the cells look like macrophages. And before we had these immunomarkers, we probably called them histiocytes uh, when we described them uh, on the H&E stains. Uh, and just note that there's plasmacytoid, plasmacytoid dendritic cell tumor, which is a form of a, it's a lymphoproliferative uh, malignancy. It's quite important. So there is a malignant uh, version of, of these cells. But this, the positivity comes not just from these cells being present, they're present in most rashes, it's clusters. And so you want a, a cluster of these cells or you want them to line up along the epidermal basalis, which I don't have a good picture of here. And sometimes they're in the epidermis too, if there's a really uh, a good interface. So this, is, this uh, stain has really, really helped us to be much more definitive in uh, lupus. And th here, this is used for hypertrophic lupus. So as I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, it can be quite difficult to tell hypertrophic lupus from lichen planus, and this stain has utility here. And it's been shown, all the variants of collagen vascular diseases pretty much have been shown to have these clusters. It's not uh, very useful if the infiltrate isn't very dense. So it needs to be uh, significant enough infiltrate, uh, intense enough. Uh, for this to, to have show the clusters. And the only other big uh, pitfall is it lights up uh, endothelial cells. I, and it's hard to see here. Let me see if I can blow this up a little bit more. Um, see there, that's a linear, that these are vessels. So these are probably lymphatics and the endothelial cells are positive. Uh, with this uh, antibody. So you can overread the clusters. You can see how you might go, oh, that's a cluster right there. So whoever's reading this needs to, to be aware of that fact. 
So anyway, that's case number one, and it's uh, lupus, uh, erythematosus, discoid, and it's a linear uh, variant of it. So the next case is uh, LSU5B, 78-year-old female with a vulvar rash. Differential included um, dermatitis and it also included extra mammary Paget's disease. So here you can see another punch biopsy. You can see how I got squeezed by the forceps of death here. And I'm gonna spend just a minute since we only have four cases talking about this. You see how that's squared off here? So this squeeze artifact can occur anywhere from at the time of the biopsy to when it gets grossed in the lab to even when sometimes when the slides are cut and floating in the water bath before they get put on the glass slide. But it's, a, it's important to be able to recognize this because uh, things look worse in the squeezed areas. And that's not too big of a deal here. But just keep in mind, whenever you see something, look for the squared off uh, features that let you know that it's squeeze artifact. And here's some more right here and here. And it's really typical for the punches to get squeezed down here. And this is a um, vulvar biopsy, which is uh, they're even more likely to get a uh, um, squeezed, uh, difficult uh, place to uh, biopsy. So anything genital. So here you can see uh, not too many inflammatory cells, but once again, we're gonna go back and look at the epidermis first. And we see a split here. Uh, the question here is, was this a, Sub, uh, sub epidermal vesicle uh, in life, or did this happen during processing? And we don't know that at this point, but they did not tell us that the patient had a uh, bulla. Uh, so I would favor this having occurred uh, afterwards, but you can right away see that things aren't uh, normal here. This epidermis is hyper, has hyperkeratosis. We have some hypergranulosis. And then we also, once again, don't have a totally normal basalis, a little bit uh, better than the last one, but it also uh, is, is similar to the uh, lupus a little bit. It's not having the nice basaloid uh, oval cells along the basalis. So this is in some ways is kind of in this lupus-like uh, uh, interface pattern. The other things you'd like to see is some necrotic keratinocytes. There are a few here. So this could be a, 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 a lupus-like interface from our list. So if we go back to the lupus-like dermatitis, we have lupus collagen vascular, a BLK, well, it's vulvar, doesn't make sense, fixed drug. We have to look at the infiltrate poro, not actinic, probably here in lichen sclerosis. So here we have like nice lichen sclerosis showing up uh, in our differential. So you can right away see this glassy smudged collagen that is quite prominent. So this is a really uh, easy and nice uh, um, <clears throat> um, example of lichen sclerosis. And we can call it bullus, uh, but once again, I said, I'm not totally sure this happened uh, during the processing. So if you look in the infiltrate, a little hard to see, a little bit of squeeze artifact or difficult to see, you're not seeing nice uh, nuclei here. Um, but they look like mostly like lymphocytes, a uh, few histiocytes maybe, not seeing any EOs. Um, uh, and then here is another piece. We don't we have an orientation to it, but I think we can see just mostly lymphocytes and some histiocytes in this uh, infiltrate. Uh, you will get uh, uh, melanophages also. So this is probably a lighter skinned patient that has not, uh, ha doesn't have a lot of post-inflammatory pigmentary alteration here. So really nice example here of lichen sclerosis. And one thing to also look for is we do see lichen sclerosis living with morphia and it's not uncommon, not generally as a genital lesion uh, purely, but uh, you should glance below and see if you see any uh, changes that suggest uh, that this is morphia. And one reason we, you know, we have the cookie cutter sign with morphia where the punch comes out and doesn't have this squeeze or this retraction even without the forceps. And so that doesn't look that way. And then morphia also tends to have thicker collagen bundles. And uh, these are clefts, artificial clefts between the collagen bundles. 
but the morphia and collagen is thicker and smudgy. I always say it looks to me like it's been left in water. It's a little bit closer to this, but we do see really good cases of lichen sclerosis and morphia overlap. So they definitely exist in the same disease spectrum and you'll see them uh, from time to time, especially on uh, truncal lesions seem to be the ones that I've seen more of. So this is a nice uh, example of lichen sclerosis and it's active. One thing I always put in the um, comment is that there is inflammation and it's active because I think it's important uh, to uh, aggressively treat this uh, in the uh, general region, uh, um, women of women before they have permanent uh, <coughs> uh, damage. So the next case uh, is LSU C1 and C2. So it's two slides from the same case. And this is a 45 year old female with an annular lesion on the right arm. And you can see right here, uh, <coughs> punch again, we have this nice squeeze artifact, which hopefully now you can uh, identify, uh, making our job a little bit harder, but we see a, not too much epidermal change here. You see a nice basket weave stratum corneum. Uh, there are some lymphocytes here. Oh, and then this is a necrotic keratinocyte. <clears throat> so in the interface, we have the um, <clears throat> um, necrotic keratinocyte uh, as a clue to uh, uh, interface, which can be quite subtle, but we also back off and look. We have superficial and deep hairy vascular and uh, <clears throat> periadnexal. Um, so uh, lupus is in our uh, differential, lymphoma is in our differential, uh, some of the other things, pityriasis lichenoides is in our di differential, uh, superficial and deep. And then you add in the interface, uh, it's, it's a really subtle interface. Uh, so it's hard to uh, be too definitive about that. And it's also it seems to have almost a spongiosis through here, which can be just because it's acute. When you see mixing a pattern, so here's some necrotic keratinocytes and then spongiosis together, you should pause and uh, think drug. Here we know we have, we have an annular lesion. And then in the infiltrate, it looks like lymphocytes the paler are some macrophages, histiocytes. Uh, right here, I just wanted to make a point about EOs and lupus. Uh, one thing you, the first question you want to ask when you see an eosinophil is one, is it an eosinophil or a neutrophil? So eosinophils are bilobed, so one lobe, two lobes. And here's a neutrophil, more. So they have more, uh, they have more lobes, but you can get pretty pink uh, uh, neutrophils. The second question you ask once you're sure it's a neutrophil, uh, and the reason I'm bringing this up is because they're quite uncommon in any collagen vascular disease, and you should question your diagnosis if you see them. That being said, they can uh, be present, and they can be present in drug-induced uh, lupus, which often <clears throat> can persist after the drug is removed. But here we see the vet, we have a vessel here. So that's a red cell right there. So this is actually living inside the vessel. So it doesn't count. Any, any uh, cell inside the vessel doesn't count as part of the infiltrate. So we're still good uh, on uh, a lupus. And then the other, uh, uh, so here's also a vessel. So we see a couple neutrophils. Yeah. So we don't want to uh, count those in the infiltrate. So we have superficial and deep. Uh, lymphocytes. And this is uh, this pattern we call coat sleeving, where they fairly tightly cuff. And we like that in polymorphous light eruption. That's the and in any of the figure eight erythemas, like erythema annulare centrifugum. So those would also be added to our uh, differential. Now those erythema annulare uh, centrifugum, if you biopsy the advancing edge, it can be spongiotic, um, generally not interface. Uh, and then uh, polymorphous light eruption has the papillary dermal edema, which you could almost imagine some of that here. So that should also be considered. One thing about this is this is a lesion on the upper arm. And if the patient doesn't have lesions also on their face, then it's unlikely to be polymorphous light eruption. And you have to take that also into the uh, history. You can go back and also do the CD123 on this and look for the clusters. 
And just keep in mind that there's probably a portion of what's been called polymorphous light eruption over the years that is actually lupus. And we didn't have CD123, but just think about it. Sun sensitive, superficial and deep um, <clears throat> uh, lymphocytes. And you can see how there's histologic and clinical overlap that might uh, be somewhat confusing. So the, that's the C1, and then here's the C2, which is a, a colloidal iron stain. <clears throat> and uh, just a comment here about mucin stain. Uh, uh, the mucin stains vary from lab to lab, and you really have to know when, where, uh, how they work in, in the lab you're using. And then it varies from site to site on the biopsy. So the scalp, uh, and that lupus lesion that we saw in the blastitis uh, case number one, it's not particularly useful to do a, um, an Alcyon blue or a colloidal iron. This is colloidal iron. Uh, on the scalp, uh, because you're going to see a lot of mucin normally. So we see it on the scalp, we see it on the digits. Um, <clears throat> acral, you can see a lot more. So it has to be used. And then the second part is, is you just have to know your lab. And one thing you can see here, which I think happened, is I think the stain got on this piece of tissue and then missed this piece of tissue. So this is done manually uh, in my lab and they probably missed some, but this here is too much. And this is really the tumid uh, feature that we see in uh, lupus erythematosus tumidus. And this is very good for that. So before we had CD123, we relied on um, mucin stains uh, quite a bit uh, for collagen vascular diseases to try to be more definitive. They've become less useful given the um, uh, CD123, uh, but this is uh, what it looks like. Uh, so it matches here. We have a, a annular lesion, upper arm, 45-year-old female. So real typical. Uh, um, real typical and good uh, clinical history for lupus. I would have done a CD123 on this uh, just to be uh, uh, definitive, uh, but I do believe that's what it is. So one other feature of lupus erythematosus tumidus or deep, uh, any deep uh, lupus is you may not see interface. So in perhaps even up to 50% of the cases, you won't see a good interface. So this is less important uh, in making the diagnosis than some of the other features. And if you can find follicular epithelium, here's a little tiny, see the hair shaft, here's a little tiny uh, follicle, you, uh, you might see some interface along here. We're not seeing great right here. And then just a comment, we, that discoid lesion we had, uh, we don't get really great perifollicular fibrosis in uh, lupus like we see in like in Plano pilaris on, in hair loss on the scalp. So here's another follicle, not great interface, uh, but that's one place you can look on these uh, uh, to, to be more definitive. So the last case is else. LSU C, right here, 78 year old female with a five centimeter oval patch on the abdomen. So here you can see that uh, what I mentioned earlier, that nice cookie cutter uh, silhouette to the punch biopsy. So you don't get that artifactual retraction that uh, you have when you have normal collagen. So that suggests that we have something sclerotic here. Uh, and uh, five centimeter oval shaped patch, ab abdomen. Right away, we don't see, uh, this is essentially a normal epidermis right here. And we see nice basaloid cells. So we were looking at that lupus and I said it was squamatized. These are these nice oval basaloid cells. We have uh, pigment here, but not a whole lot of melanophages. And then we do have some inflammatory cell infiltration. There's a little high, high power there. Here's an EO, EO here. Uh, I don't uh, have any requirement for EOs for uh, making this diagnosis. So the other feature you can see is these collagen bundles uh, are enlarged and smudged and we've lost those artifactual clefts between them. So this is what I said, it looks like it's been left in the water to me, like it's got all swollen up uh, is kind of how I think about it. One thing you have to be careful with is collagen 
I think from the breast and women can have this appearance normally. So you have to take this into account uh, clinically uh, what you're seeing. But the other things you see is we're not seeing any adnexal structures. They're, uh, and we know they lived here because these are erector pili muscles. So they've been uh, taken away. And then uh, we have a little bit of fat here, but not very much. So one feature is if you have adnexal structures, they normally will have fat around them and they'll lose this fat as you get the sclerosis. So this is morphia, uh, localized scleroderma, and it's active. You see the lymphocytic infiltrate with EOs in it. Um, I do comment on the activity uh, when the biopsy is made. Now things to uh, know about is we saw the case of uh, lichen sclerosis. So lichen sclerosis always alters the epidermis. So if we go back to the lichen sclerosis case um, right here, we had this, and this is why I don't use the atrophicus. I think it's lichen sclerosis at atrophicus because this is hyperkeratosis right here. So I think it becomes confusing uh, to people trying to make this diagnosis histologically. So we have some hypergranulosis and compact orthokeratosis and it's, uh, uh, it's best to not uh, to stay away from the eutrophicus term. But I'm going back to this to show you that the epidermis is altered. So if you have lichen sclerosis, the epidermis is always altered. And in uh, pure morphia, uh, like here, the epidermis is unaffected. So if you're going to get one of those overlap cases, uh, then you uh, uh, um, then you'll see the altered epidermis too, and um, morphia in general doesn't. Now, where does the fibrosis to sclerosis happen in morphia? It can be at all levels of the epidermis, but there are cases of deep morphia where you just see the alteration down here, nodules down here. So you have to, uh, there's a lot of uh, variance of it. A uh, few other things about this biopsy, since we don't have a lot, this was inked, but if you need to see the edge of a biopsy and there's no ink there, you can look for blood. That's a red blood cell here. And red blood cell is our na nature's ink, if you're wondering if you're at the edge of the tissue, see those red cells right through there? So they will uh, stick to the, the edge of the biopsy when it's done and it, that's helpful if you ever need it. Um, that's about it. Here's where I think the numbing needle went in. Um, and I need, and you can see the lidocaine and it'll be a like frothy pink material. Hard to see here with the very pink epidermis of the morphia. Um, eosinophilic fasciitis, uh, the only, you go there when you uh, see infiltrate and you see eosinophils and they're deep. So it's worth commenting on uh, if you see this feature in a morphia a biopsy. And that's it. Uh, we will uh, uh, just stop early. I'll just end with this uh, interface classification because I think it's uh, very good, but we've seen uh, a really nice case of lupus like dermatitis today, which was indeed lupus. And then we saw the case of uh, lichen sclerosis, which also falls under the same interface uh, 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 group. Here we see the uh, uh, kind of an acute interface in that lupus erythematosus tumidus, uh, but we had the deep, uh, we had the deep uh, component which helped us, but you can see that that's in there, collagen vascular disease. And just repeating, we don't try uh, from a histopathology uh, standpoint, to be uh, entirely specific of what of subtypes of collagen vascular disease. One last comment is we, uh, we do a lot of direct immunofluorescence and there's a lot of people who still do the biopsy for collagen vascular disease. And I would say that it is, used to say it was useful if you had a lichen planus versus hypertrophic lupus differential because you'd see the granular, uh, any of the uh, immunoglobulins uh, there, but it's it's variable and it's not um, uh, trustworthy. So the CD one two three, the plasma cytodendritic cell marker, has been much more helpful for that. But it is occasionally uh, still useful in uh, making uh, these diagnoses. But 
uh, I'm a much bigger believer in the H&E for uh, collagen vascular disease uh, diagnoses. And um, that is it for today. So we'll go back to uh, chapter lectures next week. And um, we're going to try to get these online earlier. Uh, uh, and we will be making them during the week. Uh, so there won't uh, be a Sunday afternoon uh, live lecture anymore. So any questions, email me. Uh, that's My email is Curtis in Portland. And I, I have still have the Yahoo, but I have a Gmail now. So uh, Curtis in Portland at Gmail if you have any questions about this. Thank you very much.